says, get that India, big boy. What a shot! Campbell Killer! Hello and welcome back to another edition of the Tip Sheet Podcast. As always, I'm your host, John, also known as 4020. Joining me for another week that was and another week that will be are my good friends, 60s and Quint. Fellas, another week of preseason in the books. We've got the NRL draw dropping, plenty happening in the footy space, but how are you boys doing, first of all? Well, it's getting a little bit closer to Christmas. Anyone that's been in the supermarkets and shopping centres lately would probably think it's next week. It's not quite next week, <laughs> but, but, it's, uh, but just like Christmas is getting closer, the Rugby League 2024 season is getting that little bit closer as well. The signs of that with the draw coming out and all the teams getting stuck back into pre-season training. So, you know, all in all, still a pretty good time of the year. Quint, how are you holding up, mate? Sixties, uh, tell my wife that it's not Christmas yet because I, I said to you boys last week the Christmas tree's gone up. Well, more decorations have gone up since and I'm starting to see the dog uh, walking around the house in outfits that I didn't know that we had. So are the antlers on um, it yet? <laughs> <laughs> so there's def- it's definitely a fest- festive season in our household as, as it is the supermarket, but... Um, you know, the real present came yesterday with Draw Day, so I'm keen to talk that with you boys. Yeah, you got a lot to talk mate, about. Mate, I reckon, can I just say, can I just say, mate, I reckon you're spoilt there with Maria as your missus. It's probably Christmas, 365 days a year. <laughs> uh, I'm a lucky man, very much so. <laughs> yeah, well, like you said, Quinn, a lot to get into with that NRL Draw in particular, but before we do that, as always, a quick shout-out to the sponsors of the show, Big Swing Golf, North Mead, and Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn, Norellon, and Parramatta, helping us produce each and every episode, so thanks to the boys there. John, can I just come in and send an extra special shout-out to a fellow Eels supporter who's going through a health battle at the moment, Andrew Rowland, his Parramatta's to the core, we know he listens to the podcast. He loves the Cumberland throw. Andrew, mate, we're thinking of you and we're backing you to win your battle at the moment. Yeah, blue and gold to the core there, 60s, over 40 years of support for the Parramatta Eels. Wishing you all the best, mate, and hopefully this can help lift your spirits just a bit. News team, assemble! Well, fellas, the Eels have gone on the front foot this season when it comes to injury updates. We're only into the second week of the preseason, and they've given us an update on uh, not just current injuries, but players who had injuries at the end of the season and how they're faring at the moment. So uh, we learned that Mitch Moses is uh, all fit and ready to go. Well, he was back at training on Monday, so that's not a surprise. Um, we've learned about Gutho. Well, again, it was he was back at training on Monday, but he's in his in the process of rehab, and uh, with the surgery that he had on his knee, he's hoping to uh, commence running uh, just prior to Christmas, and reckons he'll be fit for round one. Uh, this was a new one to me, Junior Paulo. A chronic toe injury. Did you fellas know anything about that? No, I think that's the first we've heard of it, and it's a yeah. It's a. I mean, I suppose it's a testament to his toughness, but also a surprise that the club would have let him go through both a boxing program mm. and a representative program. And I, I know he means a lot to the Samoan team. He is talismanic there, but uh, yeah, that's a uh, chronic toe injuries. Even though it's a very small part of your body, if you get turf toe or something similar, it is a nightmare uh, in terms of recovery. Yeah, and that's the fact to... that it's chronic as well suggests that obviously this didn't just happen in the Pacific uh, Championships either. No, exactly. And it, it might explain um, some of the criticism he copped for a little bit of a quieter season in uh, 2023. Uh, he's slated to return, it says, um, in January to training. Uh, 
I must admit that's that's also taken me by surprise because normally there's um, the rehab that they will start at training. So uh, I don't know, maybe they just feel he's due for a, a good rest. Uh, Dejan Arce, a ruptured tendon in his finger that he's had surgery on. I would expect, given that it's a hand injury, that um, as soon as he's due back to training uh, in terms of his break, because um, he was uh, was involved in um, in matches at the end of the season, uh, but as soon as he's he's ready to come back, he'll probably be running. I would think. Yeah, it's not going to preclude him from the aerobic fitness. You'd imagine. Yeah. Uh, contact and board drills might be hampering him for a bit, but. As long as he's getting his conditioning, it'll you know help him be ready for the other side of Christmas. Yep, uh, Makahesi Makatol was mentioned in the training reports that um, he's there doing rehab, but um, that's a significant injury, a pec injury um, that he's had surgery on. Now uh, it says he will be unable to train until the new year. I think he'd be out for a significant period of time, wouldn't he? With a a pec injury. We've come a long way with pec injuries, I feel. They used to be, feel like, a, sort of like a 12-month sort of thing, but now mm. they've been sort of in the, the, depending on the severity, obviously, but in the range of sort of three months, which I suppose that would put him in a post-Christmas slot to make a recovery, maybe not a, a full return to, you know, full contact and, and wrestling and whatnot, but at least being able to get back to the, the meat and potatoes of getting fit for round one. So I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be shocked, but that might be a bit optimistic. Now, they mentioned uh, Matt Dury and Zach Sini being fully fit and back to yeah. training. Cinder, well, yeah, for but, Dury and was it the same for Sini or did he hurt his hand? Yeah, I, I, I can't remember, but both of them have yeah, been back to work since It was a hip drop tackle that took Dury, I don't remember, so that, that's good to see him back. Yeah, but uh, as I said, they've both been there since the start of uh, the preseason last week, so... Um, Nothing really to report there now. And the one that caught us by surprise was Artie, Arthur Miller-Steven, that he has a serious knee injury and he's out for the entire 2024 season. Yeah. Yeah. Now, he, I'm pretty sure that the con, from speaking to him last season, that his contract for this year wasn't a top 30 and I don't think it was development. I think it was... Uh, continued um, like a train and trial uh, type uh, contract. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it's good that the clubs come out and actually um, informed us of that because uh, some people were asking what's happening with Artie and I, I didn't know anything about an injury and I just assumed he wasn't part of the full-time training squad. Um, and, and I don't know whether that, whether he, if he hadn't had the injury, whether he would have been part of the full-time training squad. You'd have to think that... Um, if it's on the report, I'd say he would have been, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, you you would have to think so. That's the extrapolation um, I think you make. But, geez, yeah, that's, that's and, so shit, that news. Like, that is just awful. Like, yeah, it just yeah. makes you sad. You see a young kid that, you know, not not to say he would have mm-hmm. you know, been storming into our old contention, but Artie's got plenty of talent. He's got speed, which is a commodity that we really like in our back line. Um, you know, scored a try on debut, and unfortunately, just terrible luck. And all you can do is wish him a speedy recovery. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, that takes us um, through the current lay of the land there. And I've uh, I've mentioned uh, about uh, pre-season training. Uh, we're now into our our second week there. We've had the likes of um, Mitch Moses, uh, RCG. Uh, Gutho, who's there with rehab, uh, back to training this week. Uh, the other players will come in uh, with most of them, apart from those on the injured list, um, should be back by the end of the month. So it's a, a little bit of a staggered return. Uh, what I will say is that uh, Moses certainly looked outstanding on Monday. Just, uh, I mean, we know how that, that he's exceptionally fast and he's walked in on the first day they're doing some sprint work and uh yeah watching moses in full flight is uh you you really do get an appreciation of just how fast he is and uh it's interesting that probably 
the Eels' uh, greatest pace in the team is found in the halves, mm. isn't it? With with uh, uh, excuse me, we had this conversation. <laughs> Fastest man in the team, Mike yeah. Sebo. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I, I look. I am still dumbfounded that. Uh, that Sivo is, you know, got that third fastest in the NRL this season. We know he's a power athlete. We didn't, we were completely unaware of the blistering pace that uh, he evidently possesses. So, um, yes. Um, but uh, look, it was a big session on Monday in terms of the time, good two hour session. But it really focused a lot on the on technical skills and tactical skills. So it was a um, lot of lot of ball work, um, defensive structures, systems around the ruck. Um, you know, a lot of players getting used to uh, or being introduced to what the Eels will operate under this year in in terms of what their um, the structures will look like in in both attack and defence. There's new players got to use get used to calls, got to use, get used to the players that they're uh, beside. So there was a bit of time dedicated to that. I'm going to expect that the next couple of field sessions might have a little bit more conditioning work in them. So um, I guess the players have got that to look forward to. Hopefully for them, it's not going to be quite as hot tomorrow as maybe it was in the last couple of days, but we'll uh, we'll soon see. Okay, fellas, this now brings us to the NRL draw and what Parramatta's draw looks like. Um, John, I'm going to throw over to you first for your takes on the draw. And, uh, Clint, I'll get you to follow on from uh, John's takes. Um, Yeah, what do you make of it, John? The the initial gut impression was that it's better than this year's draw the the season past. Uh, and, I mean, that's a pretty low bar. We, we made a, rightfully so, a pretty big song and dance about the inequities of the 2023 draw for both NRO and NRLW teams. Uh, in terms of the quirks of this draw, uh, there are some interesting ones. I believe we play five teams coming off a bye, so they're going to have that extra layer of preparedness taking on the blue and gold. It's actually technically six, but because we, uh, um, we come up the bye against Newcastle, they're quote unquote not counting it. Ah, there you go. So Clint with an eye on the details there, and I I think the most troubling part for me is if I, if we've gotten this analysis right, is that again eels are a league high uh, or in in the higher brackets of five day turnarounds, um, which I know that uh, there's mixed like feelings about how much of a detriment it is. Uh, I know that some clubs, some coaches reckon that it helps the players stay sort of laser focused. Uh, going between games, which is not a bad thing. But I think the caveat for us is that I think, though, the three five-day turnarounds fall for in essentially a month bracket for us within like a five- or six-week period, which means mm. the logistically we're going to be pushed pretty hard in that window. Um, well, actually, it's it's a, a strange balance that's there, John, because um, here's the details. Between round 13 and round 18, Parramatta play the Sharks, the Bulldogs, the Roosters, the Knights and the Rabbitohs. And the five-day turnaround happens before they play the Sharks, the Roosters, and the Rabbitohs. But also in there is a 10-day break between playing the Sharks and the Dogs. And then there's a bye between the Roosters and the Knights, which is a 14-day spell. So they've got their longest breaks in the same sequence that they've got those five-day turnarounds. So um, it's a it's a strange period that they'll be going through because um, those five day turnarounds can be tough, but you know we we do hear that the players don't mind them because they're not having to train as much. They just normally get one session in during that time, and players prefer to play than train, and that's just that's just a given. They're called players right? and trainers, right? <laughs> yeah. So, however. What BA has to make a decision about in there is does he give them some time off? If so, how much? And then how much training is done? Firstly, in that 14 day turnaround and and even that 10 day turnaround. I mean, that's a a long stretch. Now, we know that 
idle hands aren't really um, a good thing for NRL players. So um, I, I guess maybe he might consider giving them some time off in that 14-day turnaround. But I reckon he'll keep it, bus- you know, as close to business as usual in that 10-day turnaround and they'll probably get a fair bit of training in in that period. So I think I don't know, maybe... Maybe it balances out there. Yeah, I mean, I feel like giving our boys time off has invariably backfired in recent years. Yes, like, mm, yes, and, yes. And it's like, and that's, and it's tough too because you, you do want to reward them in that grind because we know that the NRL is a, a very testing marathon rather than a sprint. Uh, but yeah, the times where we have given them time off, I, I feel like we just come back all out of sort. Um, in mm. terms of the, the structure of the draw boys, uh, we've got a chance to get out of the blocks strongly. First month of football, most notable opponent, Penrith Panthers, round two. Uh, a rival that we always match up very strongly with in the regular season. Uh, but aside from that, we're opening up against the Bulldogs, the Seagulls, and the Tigers. I know that Manly are a pretty you know, competent roster, but you'd like to think that we're banking two or three wins out of those three games. And the Penrith game, even though we do dominate them in the regular season, you, you don't take it as a given. Um, it's always going to be a tough fight. But if you're coming out of that first month of football with three, maybe four wins... You're setting yourself up strongly. Um, and then at the end of the season, got a bit of a gauntlet again, boys. We come out of the bye. It's Melbourne, New Zealand, Penrith, Roosters, Broncos. So that's a pretty nasty stretch there. But the last two games, again, very winnable, St. George and the West Tigers. So interesting to see how we're going to be travelling heading into a potential finals push. Uh, a couple of really tough games there, uh, but also a couple of easier games. Yeah. Um, Clint, what's your takes on the draw? Oh, mixed feelings. Um, you know, you, we, we, we've um, touched on some of the inequities there already. Um, you know, the, the, uh, if, if I delve a little bit deeper, and Craig, I know that you and I were uh, discussing this uh, earlier today. Um, and look, they'll never get the draw perfectly right, but you know, there's obviously some error and patterns that are emerging within the systems that they use, whatever system they use to develop the draw, because you see the likes of um, teams like, Cronulla, who um, now getting, uh, well, for, it feels like the fourth or fifth consecutive year, very and, favorable draws. And, and the Cowboys, um, again, really soft draws. It is yep. crazy. Absolutely. Um, you, you look at the teams that we play once, and there's some recurring themes. We only played the Dolphins once this year, Sam again for 24. It feels like the fourth consecutive year that we've only played the Sharks once. Um, likewise, we've only got um, Newcastle once again this year. Uh, um, in 24, same as 23. Um, the Dragons, it feels like three out of the last four seasons, we've only had one game against them as well. Um, and likewise, um, the Warriors, you know, which that one I'm not as upset about, particularly given that it's a, an away game over in New Zealand and we haven't been over there in a little bit. So, you know, maybe that's that's one of the ones that's sort of fallen our way in recent years. Um, but, you know, you, you consider the strength of the competition and, and you know, um, the strength of our... Uh, opponents that we're playing twice, teams like Penrith, teams like the Broncos, teams like South and Manly, who um, aren't easy beats, despite the fact that they didn't make the semis this year. Um, you know, uh, 23, I'm glad to see that we've got, um, uh, I'm sorry, I should say 24, glad to see that we've got two games against the Tigers again, uh, Western Sydney rival when we only had the one fixture this year on our traditional Easter, Easter Monday match. So, um, yeah, look, uh, I, I, I get it's not going to please everyone. I get that you can't um, get everything bought on because there has to be give and take based on venue availability and, 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 and making it work. But, you know, you, you, you see these little patterns that emerge over the years and you, you, you wonder how much variation and, and thoughts actually been put in. And you're like, I, I'm going to put it out there, lads. Would ChatGPT do a better job of putting the draw together? Uh, I would not be shocked if it could put together a pretty interesting draw. And, and like you said, Quinn, there is a lot to cater for, uh, both for the code itself on a macro level and also the club's individual needs. But when you consistently see clubs like Cronulla and the Cowboys being top, well, top one in case of Cronulla, but you know, top three, top four in terms of easier strength of schedule year on year, despite being, uh, well, obviously uh, the Cowboys didn't make the eight last year, but prior to that being top four teams where – you I mean the whole point is that the the better you are, the, the tougher your draw is meant to be, outside of the fact that you can't play yourself, but you're meant to be scaled against more top eight opponents, and yet they don't. I don't. I don't understand. 
I don't know what is happening and why they aren't, but they somehow don't. Yeah, uh, look, I, I think it's I think it's a draw that is a long way from the best draw that we could hope for, but certainly not the worst in yeah, the end. Agreed. Um, it's, I mean, we 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 bookend um, reasonable games to start and end the season. Although you, you have to say, you, you can't really judge what an opponent is going to be like before the season starts because you know there's always surprises. Yeah, uh, plenty of variables that we, we can't yes. account for at this point in time. Injuries, the, the point in time which we play them uh, in the year, the, the weather and the conditions in which we play them, the availability of our own players and the lineup that um, each team's putting out. There's multiple contributing factors. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can you could have uh, be drawn to play um, a tough team at the start of the year, and they they just they could be a team that's traditionally um, slow to get off the mark at the start of the year, or they just happen to be this year, and then uh, other teams might play them when they're on a hot streak. There's there's as you said, the the time that you play them can have a lot to do with how you fare against particular opponents um but look as i said i think it's um a f- far from the worst that we could have got and of course the positive is that we don't have to play all three of the origin impacted rounds without um <laughs> select players <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, yeah now i mean it may well be that we don't get anyone selected this year we don't know but uh at, at least we know that we're not going to be hampered this year in the same way that we were last year, which was absolutely ridiculous. Um, you mentioned about the the strength of the opponents. Well, um, playing the Storm, the Broncos, the Seagulls, um, the Rabbitohs and the Roosters uh, twice, as well as the Panthers, that's um, uh, 12 games of really tough opponents. Oh, the big dogs, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And then, um, you know, when people talk about Okay, well, the other four finalists um, this year, uh, the Eels only have to play them once each next year, that being the Sharks, the Knights, the Warriors and the Raiders. But they're in playing them once, three of those four games are away from home. Mm. So it's still not like a, an even split there. Um, we play the Dolphins in Darwin this year, so... It's obvious that the NRL are going to give us a Queensland opponent wherever they possibly can for that Darwin fixture. And, so. and while we're on the topic of that, the, the Dolphins leading into that, I think they uh, uh, that's the first time that they leave Queensland in their draw. Uh, maybe one of our listeners might correct me um, in the comments um, once we post this, but if, if, if it's... Is the first time, if it's not the first time, I should say, it it will be only the second time that they leave the state of Queensland in their um in their opening six games. So, you know, they're going to be well acclimatized to the um the Queensland heat and rolling into Darwin, which obviously you know, much hotter and more humid place. But they're going to be um uh, more conditioned to hotter weather than what our boys will be. Well, I was told by um, the eels that I could share with listeners that we had put in our request to play the Storm up in Darwin for this season. So when you get to request an opponent for, um, you know, a particular special round, the Eels had had gone with the uh, with the Storm. So they're going for the team that was furthest south from... Um, but, but they're a Queensland side, aren't they, right? Yeah, well, yeah. that's a missed opportunity, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, look, the, the main issue with playing... Uh, teams like North Queensland and the Broncos is first of all that they are acclimatised to warmer weather, so you straight away got them. Uh, they have they have their players in. Uh, they they're not going into unfamiliar territory in terms of the conditions that they're playing in. Uh, secondly, because they are uh, Queensland teams, they're. Um, they seem to enjoy a better local following up in Darwin mm-hmm. than what the Eels do. Now, the Storm, I guess there's an element of compromise there. If, in Parramatta, suggesting that they'd like to play the, the Storm up there, they're giving Darwin, a because you've got to remember, they're, they're, 
they're a uh, a sponsor of the Eels, so they want to give them a good opponent, you know, an opponent that um, that their spectators, that that the tourists would be interested in in going to see, and having a, a team that has a lot of Queenslanders in them, like the Storm, is I guess that's good business there. But also from the Eels' point of view, they're selecting a team that's playing in completely different conditions to that. At their at their own home matches, so um, you know I I can see the logic in them requesting the storm, but the NRL obviously didn't. Um, I guess I can live with uh, the Dolphins uh, if it had if they had have given us the Cowboys the Broncos, or Broncos, yeah, and, or the Cowboys, I would have been back on my usual tirade about <laughs> um, not, not having the Darwin match. And you know there are there are people who like to talk money. And talk about the advantages that come with um, such a, a healthy sponsorship with the Northern Territory government, and I get that, I understand that, but I will always maintain, and I'm going to quote the words of Bernie Gurr here, that Parramatta is in the business of football, mm-hmm. not in the business of business. Right. So the Darwin game makes good, really good business sense. I'm not sure how much football sense it makes because it makes it when we're playing opponents like the Cowboys or the Broncos, when we're playing opponents that are better suited to the conditions, we're making it harder for our team to win a home game. And, and, I, don't, and I don't get that from a football sense. And I would you, never you, get that. You, you, throw, you throw in that we missed out the finals this year by a single victory hypothetically, if that game were at Parramatta as opposed to uh, Darwin against the Broncos, maybe some of those, uh, and and, and the same game unfolds, maybe the the pressure of the home crowd uh, ensures the referee puts Payne Haas in the sin bin. Maybe the Eels come (laughs) home the stronger and get the the home victory in that scenario. Yeah, maybe we make the finals, which would commercially be a better option and better outcome for us. Correct. So the you, you can you can arg, argue commercial good commercial outcomes. The best commercial outcomes come from a winning team, a mm-hmm. successful team. A successful team is going to do well with sponsorships. They're going to do well with um, selling merchandise. They're going to do well with ticketing. They're they're going to do well with the media. Uh, a team that struggles or is just battling to get into finals football is not going to have the same commercial success as a winning team. Two, so two important to me, I was going to say best, 60s, two important notes on that Darwin game this year is that it's a Friday to Friday turnaround. So we, instead of having that insane five day turnaround that we had last time, uh, we actually play Friday and then Friday again against Manly the following week. And even more crucially, the week after which is where we, we tend to see the big lag in terms of mm. impact on the players when it comes to the Darwin heat and all that transition is Parramatta's first buy. So that I don't know if that was a strategic nice. push by the Eels, but if it was well done, that actually lines up really nicely. Yeah, so we've got some improvements, including the Darwin opponent and the scheduling and the timing of the buys. There's there are positives to be found in the draw as well as some of the things that people aren't aren't happy about and understandably so. Uh, the other thing too is I think when it comes to the scheduling of home games, I think we've come out reasonably well there. There's I never like a Thursday night game. We've got two of those, but then that's really um, countered by the fact that we haven't got a 6 p.m. Friday game, which is, mm. you know, like that that's just the worst. That's the pits to be drawn a, a 6 p.m. Friday game. So um, we had a couple of those last year. We got none this year. We got two Thursday night home games. I think the rest of the uh, times uh, suit the Parramatta um, faithful at Combank Stadium. Um, so all in all, I think the... The draw could have been better, but, yeah, it's certainly not worse. Mm. Um, Now, fellas, I wanted to also touch on the NRLW draw because, hallelujah, 
They actually <laughs> get they actually get a reasonable share of home games this year. The NRLW team, two games at Combank Stadium and two games at Eric Tweedale Stadium at Granville. They've got to be they got to be happy with that. I mean, look, it's it's a strange old draw the NRLW because I think. Parramatta play the entire first month away from home, and then those four games come in the last five weeks of the season. Um, it, it's a strange one, but yeah, they got us down as, uh, for a home game at Allianz, which against the Cronulla Sharks, I think they've probably got <laughs> more geographical claim than us, honestly. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I always completely ignore who's allocated as the home team and I just look at the venue. Yeah. That's, a... yeah, that's the only way to talk about yeah. a home match. Um so uh Clint, what's what's your thoughts on the NRLW draw? <laughs> well, it's good to see the mistakes of uh this year corrected, you know. Um and um you know you, you'd imagine that um people from our hierarchy have spoken to the NRL hierarchy and gone, you know, when is it going to be our turn this year? And Thankfully, it looks as, that, as though that's going to be the case of the NRLW. Um, you know, we also saw the article, I think it was in the Telegraph um, yesterday or the day before, oh, sorry, um, yesterday before the draw broke that suggested that these games at Eric Trier were going to be coming um, and about um, the NRLW side getting out amongst um, their local community, given that they train out of that facility. So... Um, yeah, look, it's it's significantly improved. The the only thing that I would have, um, I, I I could um, complain about is something you already touched on there, sixties, is that um, if there was if if we was two and two home and away in the first four, then that that would have felt like we we hit the uh, the right balance. But yeah, it's a significant improvement. Yeah, John. Well, if you ask me after the first month of football, I'll give you a more definitive answer there. Uh, because if we can emerge through that first month with a even split or better, we're positioned to make a huge run. You get all those home games in that last five game stretch. That's fantastic. Uh, you 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 know really set up to make a push into the finals uh, and set up maybe a, a really high climb for the ladder. But it can also backfire spectacularly if you go zero and four in that first month because you're on the road the entire time and it's tough. You're versing in, you know huge quality teams like the Broncos, uh, the Cowboys, the Sharks, the Tigers. Um, you know, the weakest team there is probably the Cowboys, right? And uh, they're, they're not exactly a terrible team either. Um, yeah, put yourself in a tough position. So if you can navigate that first month, I'm going to be very happy with our draw. And if not, I'm going to be very upset with our draw. I think that's probably probably my nicest way of putting it. Uh, when you get those... Oh, I'm, I'm going to be interested in how the crowd responds to games at Eric Tweedale Stadium because last year there was a, a trial match that was played there against the Dragons. And there was probably about between 13, 1,500 people that rocked up to watch the trial. There was a few St. George supporters, not not a huge number. So it was mostly Eel supporters that were there, um, provided a good atmosphere for the ladies to uh, play in front of. And I think, as you say, John, if they can get through that first month and maybe get an equal split of the games, I'm sure they will get a good crowd that turns up for a a game at a, a smaller local venue and create a, a great atmosphere. Mm-hmm. And we know that Newcastle supporters will always travel and they've got a successful NRLW team. So uh, it could be, could be a great atmosphere there for that uh, match, that first match that they play out at Granville this year. Okay. We move on. Is a, a, I think we need to have like a stinger or something, John, when we reach the halfway point of the news podcast, let people know they can go to the toilet or get a cup of coffee or something like that, that we've hit the halfway point in the podcast as we flick from just general, uh, from Paramount News to a siren, a, a, a full-time yeah, siren, a half-time siren. Half-time half-time siren. siren. Yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> that, that's, that's probably a good idea. So I'll, I'll put that on to you, John, to tee up for our next podcast is the halftime siren for uh, the switchover from Eels News to NRL News. But we are now assuming that people have had their break. They put a pause on the podcast. They're now back listening to us. And we're going to jump into the latest at the dogs 
with Raymond Faitala Mariner, John. There's a, a bit going on with um, Uncle Gus there and um, and his meetings with uh, RFM. Yeah, it goes back to reports, what, about a week and a bit ago now uh, that Faitala Mariner has essentially been exiled from the club, told not to report the training uh and that sort of went in hand with speculation that he might have been the uh, or the chief among the players that led the complaints about the uh, training issues, about how uh, the training might have been too tough or too toxic. So that that was a bit of speculation that went alongside it. Uh, since then, uh, what what has got Phil Gould riled up is the fact that he's been snapped again, uh, a la some of his um, signings and uh, clan, or not so clandestine meetings, but snapped by a, a intrepid, I think, fan or member of the league's club uh, having a crisis meeting with Vitala Mariner, and it's led to Gould sort of lashing out, talking about the the silliness of the pictures and whatnot. But it's yeah, it's not the first time for Paul Gus being caught, whether it's on security cameras with players in club polos while they're still signed by another club, uh, Viliama Kikau right there, uh, or in this case, a Vitala Mariner. And yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't really know what to make of the situation. Um, it, it is very odd for the club to have a, a captain in uh, Vitala Mariner being essentially ostracised. Uh, but, yeah, I have to sort of monitor that one and see if he ends up somewhere else. Yeah, and, of course, Clint, to end up somewhere else, you've got to get another club prepared to wear um, a large proportion or a, a reasonable proportion of the salary that uh, the unwanted player is receiving. And that's not – depends on the player – it's not always an easy thing to do. You get a take at it to, to, um, to, I guess, take on a player who is on a big contract and therefore their share of the contract paid is still going to be substantial. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's, it's always funny when you hear fans of any club suggest, oh, we should move X player on so that we can uh, recruit Y players at the club. It's like, well, someone's got to want X player. Um, you know, and, and and normally when um, fans are speaking uh, about this speculative um, roster building, uh, squad building um, exercise that we, we all do throughout the, um, well, it's not even just the uh, the off seasons, all throughout the year, is, you know, you consider um, squad succession, um, and and we all wish to be a um, a head of football one day, and and and, and live out that dream. But um, I've got news know, on that front. <laughs> oh, oh, well, well, that's 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 interesting, and we'll we'll we'll, um, we'll we'll park that for a second because I think that's probably what people want to hear. So I'll make my point quickly. Um, is that um, you know we uh, someone like Raymond Fatale Marino, obviously um, it, it's it's a one eighty from the dogs to uh, to not want him because he was only extended um, earlier this year for a further two years. He was given the captaincy. Now he's not wanted. Um, we think we know the reasons or we speculate the reasons as to why that's the case. But, you know, um, it has to be a good deal for someone else to take him off the Bulldogs' hands. And you'd imagine with a lot of the teams that have finalised their squads um, to this uh, for season 2024 in terms of big spend, if he's on any decent money, um, that's not an um, enticing proposition for another club um, to try and take over that deal because they simply don't have the ability to do so. So the Bulldogs, if they're looking to offload him, are probably going to have to wear a significant portion of his salary themselves. And so it becomes a case of, um, you, you'd imagine, whether they choose to do that or he potentially sits out the season or gets a gets a payout and is, is no longer welcome back at the club. Um, an interesting situation um, unfolding there. Um, and, you know, it's it's... it's it's not uncommon that something like that has happened in uh, Gus Gould um, head of football run clubs. Um, you know, we saw plenty of senior players move on at Penrith pretty quickly after being signed to uh, long term deals. Um, so, yeah, uh, something to watch in the coming weeks, I'd imagine. Yeah, it becomes interesting as uh, you, even if you've got a club that's interested, the negotiations about how much of the freight the Bulldogs would expect them to pay can be, uh, I guess that can be something that uh, can put a, a block on the deal because they're obviously looking, any other any club that's picking up a player being shed is looking for a bargain. Mm. They're looking to get a player at a cheaper rate than what they might expect to play 
uh, pay. And for, why wouldn't they? They they got to get a good deal. They got to get a good to, deal to balance the books and a player that will add value um, to their wider squad. So yeah. it has to be a good deal for both sides, not just one. That's right. And uh, Forty mentioned that he just extended by two years. So there's the length of the contract that has to be taken on. Um, you you're talking about um, the Bulldogs as well. That the longer the the less that um, a, a new club is going to pay them means that it then becomes unattractive for them to move that particular player on because they've got money that's coming out of their salary cap then that's being used by another club. So there's there's no benefit to them there. And uh, maybe all the, the, the only benefit is getting a top 30 roster spot. But by the same token... They, if we are to believe reports, they need the cap space rather than just the spot to, mm. um, you know, to, to help their, their situation there. So, yeah, interesting times. And I mean, as the... Do, as the do we reckon he might want to take up boxing? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But as the weeks tick on and tick on by, the Bulldogs are still paying him. Mm. So... Right now, even if he's, as they've said, it's it's rumoured that he's been told he's, you know, don't worry about coming down to training. We aren't interested in you being here. They still have to pay him. Mm-hmm. And for every week he's sitting around doing nothing, he's still drawing pay from the Bulldogs and all of that pay is put into their salary cap. It's all counted as part of their salary cap. So the longer it goes on, the uh, more unfavourable it is for the dogs there. And if he's got, okay. and the other thing it's worth mentioning too is if the situation either gets more toxic or if he's got performance based incentives in his contract that he's been precluded from earning when it comes to round one and beyond because they're exiling him because of this dispute, you wouldn't be surprised to see the RLPA getting involved. Mm. Well, it becomes yeah. a restraint of trade in that situation, mm-hmm. doesn't it? Because he's he's prevented from um, potential earning capacity and increasing his his earnings, and and then subsequently um, having that denied future earnings on top of that. Yeah, mm-hmm. that does become interesting if it does have those performance incentives. Um, now, moving from the bulldogs to the dragons and the roosters, well. The Dragons had a bit of fun, as all clubs did, with their draw reveals. And they were playing a bit of charades. And there was um, a charade that was between Jack Bird and Kyle Flanagan. And uh, evidently the Roosters Supremo wasn't too happy about this particular charade, John. Yeah, I actually missed it and you were the one that informed me, but uh, playing charades with the Roosters, and I think it was uh, something about a little paper bag and some cashola uh, going there. and uh, the players, Yeah, the money uh, shower. Yeah, having, money a bit, having a bit of fun <laughs> having a bit of fun with uh, you know payments on the side there, which, um, as we discussed pre- prior to the podcast, you got the uh, likes of Brian Fletcher and company constantly taking the mickey out of themselves and the club in regards to the, the third-party payments there, but... Evidently, there's been a bit of a backlash there. It's uh, different when current players and active uh, members of the NRL do it. And uh, it looks like it's been stepped back and replaced with a different uh, charade or mime or uh, sort of meme. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, having a look at it today, it's uh, it, it doesn't feature anymore on the Dragons' uh, in social media sites. Um, and that's a shame because, I mean, it's, it's, it's a bit of fun. I don't know. Yeah, exactly it, right. It, Clint, did it step over the line? No, it's a bit of fun, you know, and it's it's yeah, it, it it's 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 on honestly just comes part and parcel with the territory with the roosters, and if they can't have a laugh at themselves with it, you know, like it, the, the fact of the matter is, all clubs get made fun of, and you know, I I, I didn't see the dragons one uh, video itself, but I saw the Melbourne one where they were going around Melbourne, um, you know, uh, speaking to. Um, people in the street who clearly didn't know much about rugby league. And, you know, the, the joke being because they're based in Victoria, that not many people are following rugby league there versus the AFL. And, you know, I, 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 I thought that was, that was a nice little bit of fun for them to have and poke a little bit of fun at themselves and, and rugby league. And, you know, it's, as I said, it's part and parcel of the Roosters territory that, you know, 
um, because they've had stacked rosters and stacked um, sides for so long, everyone's gone, how can they afford them? It's, it's, it's a bit of fun. You know, the, the Roosters taking exception to that probably makes me wonder if there's a little bit more to some of those jokes. And, you know, it's, it's, it's almost the case of if they're taking it personally, is it's like, oh, you know, is, 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 is there potential truth to this that's cutting a little bit deep? I don't know. I'm being completely speculative here, of course. So, um, you know, to, to, to me, it's a bit of, it, it's views a bit ex- of fun. The views expressed by Clint G are purely the views of Clint G and not those of 60s or 40-20. <laughs> I don't even know the, if they're the, the couple of front. G, to, be, to be perfectly honest. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, like it's, it's the, the, the point of these things is that it's a, it, it's a little bit of fun. So, you know, um, I, I, sorry, confirm for me, 16. So was it taken down because the Roosters took exception to it or was it taken down because the Dragons thought, oh, you know what, maybe we're crossing the line and what we've done and we'll just change that? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it was – we saw a, on the uh, on the news tonight uh, Politis saying that he, he thinks it's pretty stupid stuff and, it does, you know, it's 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 not a, not a good look. Um, and I thought, I wonder – if it's still if he's had a word <laughs> on social me- on the on the dragon social media and uh yeah that that particular role no longer features the mm. um the the cash shower so um yeah it's it's a, it's a it's a shame it's like i think it's a bit of fun and i think when you've got legends of the roosters that on the Matty John show with the Fletch and Hindy stuff, join in with Fletch for the the laughs about the, mm. you know, the rumours about how they, you know, that they're always got, you know, extra money to be found for players and what have you, and and you know they 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 have a laugh at themselves, and you know mm. what I think when you can have a laugh at yourself, it's. Well, I guess it's the opposite of what you're saying there, Clint, is that mm. if you if you can take the mickey out of yourself, it means that you're confident that, yeah, absolutely. you know, that it's just, it, that it's all in fun and there isn't any truth to it, right? And, and the fact of the matter is that, that, that um, they as former representatives of the club are giving the public and, 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 and choosing to handle it that way in a public forum on a TV show are giving the public permission that it's okay to joke about that as well. Yeah. So, you know, uh, but that, that that that's indirectly what they're communicating. So you know, I, I wouldn't be getting annoyed at the dragons. You know, I'd be looking at if, if if that's something that you want to stop, I would be looking at your former representative and saying, hey, you know, you may not necessarily play here anymore, but if you're going to talk about um, our organisation, you're still a represent, representative of it. You're still an ambassador of it of sorts, even if it's not in an official capacity, because you have worn the badge on your on your chest. So. You know, in the future, we'd appreciate that if you you stop doing that, and then naturally other people will stop doing it. Yeah, and look, you know what? I'm all for being able to see a bit of fun um, with that the players can have out there in um, in social media or uh, official media, yeah. and and I'm looking forward actually to next year to see how involved uh, more clubs become or how creative they become with these draw reveals because. Um, there was a wide-ranging um, approach to the draw reveals. All of them, obviously, looking to have a bit of fun with it. But I think it, it's it's going to become one of those big things on the on the rugby league calendar. And mm-hmm. I'm I'm looking forward to seeing how where where that goes. Next thing I wanted to talk about was something that I, I'm not going to say it was a long time coming. It was simply the obvious step that had to be taken, and that's the women's origin now is a three-game series, um, starting at Suncorp, then going to Newcastle. And I think that's a, a great nod to the people of Newcastle and to the success of the Newcastle Knights NRLW team. And then the third game being in Townsville. So it's... Um, Three game series. The players want it. The public want it. John, anything really that we could add to that? No, uh, the NRL got it right. Well done. Uh, you can give yourselves a pat on the back for that one. Uh, yeah. yeah, common sense, good move. Uh, hard to see anything but massive positives out of this one. Yep. Now, there's not really too much to say about the men's. Uh, the venues being Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. 
next year so they continue that push to interstate. Um, good thing, Clint, the interstate push with Origin. Uh, look, I can make a case both ways, to be perfectly honest. Um, you know, I, 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 I find it weird um, when there is the Melbourne interstate game because um, that's a venue that typically favours uh, Queensland more than it does New South Wales. Um, and I always do find it funny um, in in years uh, uh, in years that we take the um, the third game, or when I say third game, I mean the the non Sydney or Brisbane home game for each state um, to Melbourne. You know, following years in which um, Queensland has had a traditional um, home away home game, I know that hasn't happened this year, but there has been a history of that in the past, and um, so. Yeah, look, I've, because of that, and the, the reason I bring that up because of that is because um, it's the Melbourne game's always had a little bit of a funny feeling for me because I've, I've, I've viewed it um, as a, uh, a loose, quote-unquote, um, Queensland home game. So it's kind of like it's going, New South Wales, you're opening the series, and if you bugger that up, well, you've got to play two away games in, in unfriendly territory, whereas you, know, you, you consider Perth and Adelaide a little bit more like, truly neutral. So, um, yeah, but like, you know, um, it's it, at this point in time, Origin continues to be the exhibition uh, game um, that we want to uh, advertise and highlight. And, you know, um, it's uh, for our American listeners who aren't familiar with Origin uh, and a mid-season All-Stars equivalent. So, um, look, I, I don't I don't have a problem with them experimenting with that and, and, and taking it places and you know, trying to consolidate um, the game's footprint. And, of course, the good thing to see is that the under-19s origin matches, both the uh, male and female, are getting a little bit more of a higher profile. It's uh, having the coverage now on uh, the broadcast channels. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's being promoted a little bit more heavily. And I think the obvious reason for that is that we're starting to see uh, more clearly defined um, pathways that these young players who are on show in Origin um, are appearing in the NRL in often in the same season that they're that they're there in the uh, 19s Origin, and if they're not making their debut in that same year, they're making their debut the next year. So people can see that these are real talents that have been identified. And it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a, a, a great thing for the game that it's like established. I mean, the pathway was already there in terms of the age origin, but promoting the age origin gives that a little bit more of the pathway being visible to supporters of the game. And it's not like it's a huge chip in the NRL's stack here, but it is an important differentiation from fellow competitive codes in that the NRL has the best and the most exciting elite pathways. Its representative for age programs are the funnest to watch, and having that actually been on TV is good. Like Seeing 19's origin for both men and women is good. And the quality of the games is always... I mean, every now and then there is a blowout, but you see that state versus state passion, and you see the best players, boy or girl, getting the chance to star. You know, we get some funny things happen, like we saw this year with... It was the game of Ethan's where you had Ethan Strange, Ethan Sanders, and uh, <laughs> Ethan Ferguson all popping off in that ga- in that one particular game. And stuff like that's really fun to watch, whether you're invested in an individual player in your own club or just watching the game in a, uh, a certain neutral or semi-neutral capacity. Or whether you've been monitoring the most popular boys' names every year for the last... <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's your payoff, and, exactly. And, and there's the payoff, yeah. <laughs> okay, fellas, well, that actually wraps things up we've i think we've managed to get through tonight's podcast in record time uh once again thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in and and keeping us part of your week even during the off season and pre-season we'll keep continuing with the news podcast throughout the off season throughout the pre-season uh we will continue to bring you special episodes of the tip sheet And I did sort of hint when we were talking about head of football 
that um, you know might have news there. Well, I think stand by. We're just negotiating when we get to record with a certain head of football at the Eels. So that's coming up fairly soon. We'll try to keep these special podcasts coming your way over the summer months. Um, again, thank you, Clint and John, for another fine episode. Thank you to our sponsors, Big Swing Golf North Mead and Star Partners Real Estate, Auburn, Norellan and Parramatta. And as I always say, go you mighty eels. <laughs>